Welcome back to this session on uh, flipped classrooms and this is the last session in this three days of uh, synchronous remote classroom uh, period and what we have seen so far are the ideas of um, learning objectives, how to use visualization as a technology, then concept maps, then and today morning we had sessions on how to write assessment questions which are aligned with learning objectives. And this flipped classroom is another um, technology that we will be now looking at. So many of you may have heard the term flipped classroom and it has been popular for the past few years and you might have even read in newspapers and articles about it. So before we get into defining what this flipped classroom is, let us do one small activity. So here is a scenario. Consider two teachers A and B who are teaching the same topic and both these teachers have different styles of teaching. So teacher A gives a lecture on the topic in the class followed by problem solving exercises and assignments which the students have to do at home. Teacher B on the other hand asks students to watch a video of the lecture at home before coming to the class. So teacher B might create the video or teacher B might post a link to a video on the topic from some other repository but asks the students that you have to watch this video before you come to class and then does the problem solving activities in the class itself. Our role right now is to try to figure out the pros and cons of both of these styles through an activity of a debate. So I request the coordinators at the various remote centers to make two groups A and B you know, and if that is not working out maybe you can even make smaller groups of multiple groups of A and multiple groups of B and so on. And what the participants need to do at this point is those who are in group A should list points for why teacher A strategy is better than teacher B. So teacher A strategy let us recall is the strategy of giving a lecture on the topic followed by problem solving exercises which the students have to do at home. Okay. And the participants who are in group B should list points for why teacher B's strategy is better than teacher A. So once again let us look at what teacher B strategy is. Teacher B strategy is teacher B asks the students to watch a video of the lecture at home before coming to the class and does the problem solving activities in the class itself. So what you have to do is list points for why the strategy of your group teacher is better than that of the other groups teacher. So we can take about 10 minutes to complete this activity and as and when the activity is completed at your center coordinators can send two main points in favor of teacher A and two main points in favor of teacher B through the chat. So in some centers where there are only two people one of them can play the role of A and the other can play the role of B. Right now what you are supposed to do is the activity at your end and some of you have to play the role of teacher A and come up with points where teacher A strategy is better and others have to play the role of teacher B and come up with points where teacher B's strategy is better. Coming back most of you have had a chance to debate and many of you have sent in good answers and we have also just now conducted the poll which shows that more than uh, it is almost 50-50 a little bit 60-40 in favor of teacher B, B is the uh, opinion and let me read out some of the points that came from the various centers. Okay, so in, one, in one case somebody is saying that teacher B can give emphasis on higher cognitive levels, we can ensure student involvement in learning. In another case teacher A somebody is saying that it is possible to do direct interaction and 
immediate clarification of doubts. So, somebody else again for A is saying that it is better to give the lecture by teacher for concept clearing before going on to problem analysis. Again for teacher B somebody is saying that student can take their own time to listen to lectures and doubts can be clarified in the class later. Somebody else is saying that for slow learners can keep repeating the re recorded video in the case of teacher B. Okay, so, these are some of the responses that you have sent and all, all of them are valid points. I think we can uh, stop sending responses on the chat and move on to the basic idea here. Okay, so, let me just try to summarize. I mean most of your points actually fall largely within this idea of for teacher A, there are two perspectives that we want to look at it from. So, one perspective is that the teacher's perspective itself, okay, wherein what we want to say is that the teachers can adapt the lecture dynamically to the student's response. Okay. So, that what we are saying as immediate clarification all of those things are possible. And then from the student's perspective again, the advantage seems to be that the student can ask questions to the teacher, the student can see the teacher in the classroom, all of those seem to be the advantages of the teacher A model. However, the key drawback here is that the student does not have access to the teacher while working on the problems at home. Okay. So, here there is an important point to keep in mind that is we become experts only when we do things, right? we do not become experts by hearing things. So, in order to develop expertise or mastery in a subject, it is necessary for the students to practice and it is necessary for the students to actually do something with the material that the teacher is saying. So, and that activity happens in the at home and at this point the student does not have access to the teacher. So, also the teacher does not know what difficulties the students face while doing the problem solving. Okay, on the other hand now let us look at teacher B. So, from the teacher B's perspective you are having the video at home and exercises are being done in class. Now, what happens is from the teacher's perspective, the teacher can address students' problem solving difficulties in the class itself. Okay. So, it is not difficulties with respect to understanding of the topic, it is not at the recall or the understand level, but it is at the apply and the higher levels. Difficulties that arise at that level can be addressed by teacher B in the class. Okay. The advantage for the students again is that the students can watch the lecture video at their own pace. So, if they want to repeat, if they did not understand something, they can go back and get that or and the second thing is when they are in class, they can get immediate help from peers and the teacher during the problem solving process. So, this is the advantage from the students perspective. Also, this there are some points which are common in both the cases. For example, there is a point which one of the centers is saying that there is eye to eye contact between the student and the teacher that is important. And what you can see is that it is possible in both the modes, it is possible for teacher A also to have this eye to eye contact as well as for teacher B to have the eye to eye contact. So, essentially what is happening is that the total amount of time of the study is remaining the same and the difference is in what students do in class versus what students do at home. Okay. So, having said that as the background, the learning objectives for this session are fairly straightforward. In the first case, you will be able to describe what is the flipped classroom and what are its advantages. And in the second instance, you will be able to identify some active learning strategies to effectively integrate flipped classroom into your teaching. So, this session will immediately flow into the lab, wherein you will be actually creating videos, you will be able to state guidelines to create videos and you will be able to create videos as well as you will be able to design active learning strategies for your course. So, that will happen in the lab which follows immediately after the session. So, let us try to reflect about what happens in a typical traditional classroom. So, in such a classroom what happens during class is most mostly information transmission, okay. information transmission means the instructor is giving a lecture and students are taking notes. 
Sometimes the instructor may ask questions to which students respond. Sometimes the students ask questions to which the instructor responds. Okay, and what is happening outside the classroom is the activity of assimilation or the students becoming getting some mastery over the content. Okay. And this is done by the instructor giving problem sets and assignments which students have to solve and submit. And now students may work individually or work in groups. Okay, so, I will pause here for a minute for you to reflect upon what are the limitations, what might be the limitations of such a classroom. Okay, so, having given you one minute to reflect, so let, let us look at some limitations. There are some uh, centers which are still sending in the limitations, it is very encouraging that many of the limitations that you are sending in are actually matching with uh, the limitations that I have listed on this slide. So, let us just quickly look at these limitations. Okay. So, during class when there is the information transmission that happens, the instructor is lecturing. So, often as instructors we think that we want to, we are the ones who are most excited about our content right. I mean, even right now I am speaking and I am excited about saying this, I do not know how many of you are actually listening to me right. So, that is one reason that students do not pay utmost attention to the instructor's lecture, okay, however good it may be. And students, the second thing is students assume that they can understand because they can follow the lecture. So, this is a big drawback with the lecturing model. And even if we improve on lecturing by having some interactivity such as instructor asking questions, often what happens is that these questions are answered only by a few students typically who are the high achievers or the toppers of the class and others are left behind. On the other hand when students ask questions, often these questions are also asked only by a few students and sometimes the instructor makes the assumption that because a few students have understood and have asked some advanced questions, the entire class is able to follow at that level and so the instructor sometimes unwittingly goes ahead with the material when a large part of the class has not been able to keep up, has not been able to apply the learning that has been transmitted in that particular session. So, that is one limitation of the traditional classroom from the during class perspective. If you look at the limitation of the traditional classroom from the outside the class perspective during the assimilation phase. So, now the instructor feels that okay, I have given problem sets and I have given assignments to the students and if they do these problems and assignments then they will attain mastery over the content. So, now what may happen is that these problem sets and assignments may be too challenging for some students. On the other hand they may be too simple or boring for other students. In both cases students may not may lose interest in solving these problems and the instructor often does not come to know which student is having what type of difficulty. So, instructor does not know which are the students who have found it challenging, instructor does not know which are the students who have found it boring. Okay. So, it can possibly lead to copying of the answers. Okay. So, the second reason is that students study individually or in groups and this typically happens just before the assignment submission deadline or the exam which may cause students to focus on the assessment and not on the concept mastery itself. Okay. So, again most of us are familiar you know most of us often say that you know students study only at the last minute. So, considering that perspective what is likely to happen in a traditional classroom is that even though the instructor has given lot of problem sets and assignments for the students to practice all of this practice often for a majority of the students gets postponed to a few days before the exam right that is a very common phenomenon that we uh, observe in our classes. So, there will be those students who do it very diligently early and there will be the, some students who will never do it both extremes are there, but for the large part the students will do it only when there is some forcing function such as a submission deadline or an exam. So, the drawback of doing that is that the students focus at that point because of the deadline is on the assessment and it is not on the concept attainment. So, these are the two major limitations of the traditional classroom. Okay, 
see so what is this flipping the classroom okay, flipping the classroom is simply about going from information transmission in the class and assimilation outside the class which is the traditional model to saying that let us move this information transmission to outside the class and let us move this assimilation to inside the class. So, the reason for doing this moving the information transmission to outside the class is that with the help of technology it is easy to capture this information transmission and we can let students work on the lower cognitive levels such as what is the definition of something, explain how something else work, explain the process of some other system all those style level of concepts can be worked on by looking at the information transmission and the higher order concepts or higher order cognitive levels they can be dealt with in class which is where the students have the difficulty. So, the key idea of a flip classroom is so this is the flip that is happening information transmission instead of happening in class that is moved to outside class and assimilation instead of happening outside class is moved to the in class. So, this is the main crux of the flip classroom idea. So, what is flip classroom just to recap flip classroom is one way to ensure that class time is spent in assimilation rather than information transmission. So, the instructor typically finds or creates videos on the topic and students watch these videos before coming to the class and then the class time is spent in activities and discussion. So, this is the important part of the flip classroom uh, model where the class time is spent in activities and discussions. See often even when we say that look I want my students to understand this topic deeply what essentially we mean as instructors is that we want the student to acquire some level of mastery beyond recall and comprehend levels. So, what we would also as teachers be happy with is to help students assimilate the information and to get them to attain that level of mastery. So, that is what the class time in a flipped classroom is spent on rather than simply in information transmission. So, that is the key difference between the traditional model and the flipped classroom model. Okay, so, before we go much farther into what exactly are uh, is a flipped classroom let us just get an idea of what these videos look like. So, what, what sort of videos do instructors create typically videos are 10 to 20 minute lectures on one concept. Okay. So, videos may include slides they may include audio they may include some annotation they may include writing on a tablet or screen capture of an application. Okay. There are many many such videos that can be seen on the web. So, here are some sites and what I will do now is just to quickly show you a glimpse of one of these videos. Okay, so, this is a video from Khan Academy and it is on Pythagoras theorem. So, we have bypassed this uh, question of uh, is it in my uh, discipline or is it in your discipline by simply taking a topic which is from high school level.
Pythagorean tell, theorem tells us that if and only if this is a right triangle, then a squared plus b squared is going to be equal to c squared. And we can use this information. If we know two of these, we can then use this theorem, this formula, to solve for the third. And I'll give you one more piece of. OK, so that was a glimpse of what happens in one of these videos. I mean, I'm sure you all, all have seen such videos on the net. And uh, the key idea about a flipped classroom video is such a video is created very specifically for a short duration. So about 10 to 20 minutes or maybe sometimes even a 5 minute video or rarely beyond 20 minute videos. Okay, so that is a flip classroom video and in that one concept is explained the basic idea like what we just now saw was the basic idea of the Pythagoras theorem of a square plus b square is equal to c square where a and b are on the two sides. Okay, so that is what happens in the video and then what happens in the classroom itself is again an interesting point. Now the content that the students have watched is given some context. So often in the classroom the instructor will pick up some real world scenario. So for example, if you were the instructor, you might pick up uh, an actual um, a building whose um, height you want to estimate or some such mechanism, some such real world scenario wherein you want to uh, apply the Pythagoras theorem in order to solve a problem. Okay. So as a result of which students are now actively engaged in problem solving and critical thinking beyond the traditional course. Okay. So the students are not coming to your classroom to hear you say that a square plus b square is equal to c square. On the other hand, students are coming to the classroom to work out problems which deepens their understanding of the Pythagoras theorem. So what do we mean by deepens the understanding is that they are able to apply it in various uh, scenarios, they are able to analyze a problem and see whether it is a problem for Pythagoras theorem and so on. So the other advantages of flipped classroom activities are that students are now encouraged to ask exploratory questions and delve beyond the core curriculum. And they can be transformed from passive listeners to active learners. So this is the big advantage. And why is this a big advantage? Because we already know, we have seen in the previous sessions that active learning has great deal of benefit. So just to recall, what is active learning? In active learning, the instructor creates carefully designed activities that require students to talk, write, reflect and express their thinking. And students go beyond listening, copying of notes and execution of prescribed procedures. So students actually take ownership of their learning. And we know that the benefits of active learning are that students are actively engaged with the content and learn from each other. It builds a friendly yet academic atmosphere in the classroom. And most importantly, it includes all the students in the teaching learning process and not just those students who are highly self-motivated or who are um, high achievers in that particular classroom. So the key idea of flipped classrooms and active learning is that a classroom with instructor and peers present is more useful for students to apply their learning rather than listening to information transmission and asking clarifications. So the point here that is being made is that it is not that information transmission is not important. Information transmission is also important. But the time that the student spends with the instructor and the peers is better spent in students learning to apply the knowledge that they have gained in the information transmission than rather than simply listening to the information transmission. Okay. So the important thing is in a flipped classroom, the in-class time can be devoted to tasks that promote active learning. Since this information transmission part of the class happens before the students come to the class. Okay, so let's ask the question. The next obvious question that we would have in our minds is that okay, it's all fine, does it really work? So the key idea here again is that there are many studies that establish the benefits of active learning strategies. 
Now what is a flip classroom? Flip classroom is nothing but a student doing some activity outside of class, student doing some preparatory activity such as watching a video or reading some material and doing a lot of active learning on that material in the class. Okay. So as a result of which the flip classrooms that incorporate active learning automatically get the benefits of these active learning strategies. Okay. So there are many papers on these um, strategies, one of them is as far back as 2001 the idea of flipped classroom with peer instruction uh, showed that students who worked in that model had significant learning gains compared to traditional instruction. And then there were other research work, controlled group studies, which uh, showed that flipping the classroom with small group discussions can also produce significant learning gains. So there are gains not only in terms of student learning, that students learn better and they are able to perform better in the exams, but also there are gains in terms of students are more interested in the topic, students come to class and all those other advantages are also been documented. Okay. So to summarize what we have seen so far, why is flipped classroom a good idea? Because the class time is spent in assimilation rather than information transmission. Secondly, because the class time is spent in the higher cognitive levels of apply, analyze and create on that topic rather than lower levels of recall and understand. And third, the support of peers and the instructor is available to the student while they are working on these higher cognitive levels. So if there is a doubt or if there is some clarification or if there is some quick uh, conception that needs to be corrected, all of that can happen while the student is working on these uh, problems or on these activities which are targeting the higher cognitive levels. Okay. So now having spoken so much, let us do an activity. So this activity is a hypothetical situation that you have to imagine. So the situation is like this, suppose your institute made it compulsory for you to use the flipped classroom mode. So what is the flipped classroom mode to repeat? So you would have a video which the students watch outside of class and then you design some activities for the students to work on during the class. Okay. So suppose you are using the flipped classroom mode, the institute made it compulsory for you to use the flipped classroom mode. Okay. It turns out that you found an excellent video on your topic and you have asked your students to watch it before the class. Okay. So now the question is what are you going to do in the class? So that is the think phase activity. What is it that you will do in the class? So do write down your answer and just imagine that you are in such a situation where students have already watched the video and now they have come to the class. You can take about 2 minutes to think and write down your answers. So moving on, so assuming that all of you have written down individual answers, okay, even though I could see that in some centers people were very relaxed and post lunch uh, had set in. So nevertheless, let us assume that all of you have written individual answers. So what you want to do in this pair phase is to examine your neighbor's answer and see whether that person's idea will help students to work on higher cognitive levels. So this is the key because that is what we want students to do in class in the assimilation phase. Okay. So now some of you have already sent me answers like um, saying that I will do a group discussion or I will conduct a quiz or I will discuss a summary of the video followed by clarifications. Okay. Make answers more specific so that your strategy can develop the higher cognitive levels of the students. So, and then I will ask the coordinators to summarize. So you can just hold off on sending me responses through the chat. Okay, I will move on to the next phase since many of you have already started sending me the answers. So the idea here now in the share phase is to share your answer with your colleagues in your center itself. So rather than say in generic terms that I will do a group discussion, if you can give examples to your colleagues of what topic they would have watched the video on and what is it that 
you will actually do in the group discussion, what will you do and what will the students do during the group discussion that will be more useful. Okay, so, let us come back and let me talk about some of the answers that uh, I have got from the various centers. Okay. So, some of the answers that are here are that you know, discuss the summary of the video followed by problem solving in the classroom, then somebody else is saying that assign problem to groups of students at different levels, somebody else is saying that I will ask a question based on the video and invoke discussion and then coordinate the discussion. Okay, there are others who are saying that I will uh, ask the students to write the overall view of the concept. There is one other idea here where which says that I will ask the students to generate a question based on the concept. And then there are many of your answers are of the type that I will simplify the video content for the student as well as I will explain or clarify questions for the students. So, the point that you want to reflect on is, is does simplification help the student to achieve the higher cognitive level or would it have been easier for you to create a simpler video which the student has to watch. Okay. There are other suggestions also which are coming in which says that discuss solutions and make corrections make a group to do a presentation. So, many such uh, good ideas have also emerged through this discussion. Some others are simply saying debate, think pair, share activities and quiz. So, let me go on to talk about what are the key steps that one has to keep in mind for a flipped classroom. So, before that let us look at two examples. So, this is an example from two courses that I have taught. So, in a course on computer programming where the topic was arrays, the pre class activity that the students had to do was to watch a video that defines an array, what is an array. So, the video basically says that uh, an array is nothing but a collection of elements and this is the way to define an array in C++ and then it shows C++ examples on using arrays. So, simple examples of how arrays can be declared in a program and how they can be used in a program. So, that is the pre class activity which does this video very uh, similar in uh, idea to the Khan Academy video that we saw. And then the in class activity were of two types. Okay. One type was to give a worksheet which has problems or programs using arrays. Now, for some of these programs, the program was given and the students had to predict the output. Okay. So, in some cases, so there are three typical ways in which uh, computer programming can be encouraged. So, one is by asking students to predict the output of some program, in another case is to asking students to debug a given program and in the third case is by asking them to write programs. So, what we did was to have students predict the output of some of these programs, then debug other programs and also insert missing code into the programs. So, what this worksheet actually did for the student was that instead of simply knowing the topic of arrays in theory and having seen some examples of arrays, they now actually worked with programs in the class and wherever they got stuck, they could simply raise their hand and either a TA or the instructor or one of their peers would be available in order to clarify the point at which they were stuck. So, that was actually a, a good um, session for the students because they were actually working with the content and not simply listening to the content. The second in class activity that we did was getting them to write think pair share activity to write a program to sort the array. So, for example, in the think phase all that the students had to do was to come up with some pseudo code idea of how will I sort 10 numbers. Suppose 10 numbers are given, what is the mechanism that I will use in order to, to sort those 10 numbers. So, those 10 numbers are the array. Then in the pair phase the students can go on to work with a partner to write the C++ code for sorting their numbers and in the share phase they can go on to looking at 
comparing their program with the instructor's program to sort the array. So, that was the think pair share activity for this flip classroom. Here is another example. This is an example from another course called communication networks and the topic was IP addressing. Okay, so, the topic of IP addressing once again is a topic which I used to find a little had a lot of information transmission in it. So, the pre class activity here was that they simply watched the video that described the basic mechanism for assigning IP addresses in a network. Okay. So, the pre class activity was simply watching the video and all that the video con contained was that there are different classes of IP address, there is a class A, there is a class B and there is a class C and so on. Okay. Now, subsequently when they came to class, they did not need to be described what these various types of IP addresses are and so they could simply directly go on to peer instruction questions on the IP address classes. So, you could give an IP address and ask them to identify whether it is a class A or a class B or a class C or you could ask them to write the how does a class A address look. So, questions of that sort could be dealt with in the classroom. The second such activity that they could do was a debate on the pros and cons of hierarchical addressing. So, the way the internet addresses are set up is that a good way, is there a better way to do the addressing of uh, computers was another debate that they could do. And the third activity that they did in the classroom was to design solutions to reduce the inefficient use of address space. So, sometimes the IP address space gets wasted because of uh, one organization being allotted more IP addresses than it actually requires. And so, the students themselves had to think of ways in which these inefficient use of this address space can be reduced and then all that I had to do as the instructor was to point out that each of these solutions that the students came up with were nothing but the names of some of the efficiency increasing mechanisms that were already there in the internet. Okay. And the details of those mechanisms then made the content for the next flipped classroom uh, session. Okay. So, here again we will take a pause to alert ourselves about one point. Okay. So, often a flipped classroom is mistaken for the video aspect only. So, that is why it is important for us to keep in mind that a flipped classroom is not an instructor simply creating lecture videos and making them available. It is not an instructor simply finding lecture videos and asking students to watch them. It is not a student simply watching these lecture videos or attempting to learn the subject on their own and it is not the instructor simply giving clarifications to these videos or the content of these videos in the classroom. So, what is important is all of this is required, but it is incomplete without the latter part which is that the instructor needs to create structured learning activities to be carried out in the class for the students to apply what they learned from the videos. So, this last part of applying what they learnt from the videos is crucial aspect of the flip classroom model. So, the key elements of a flip classroom are there are four ideas here. So, the first idea is to give students an opportunity to gain first exposure to the topic before coming to the class. So, this can be by the means of a video or in some cases in some subjects you could simply assign reading material saying that okay, read this section from that book and before you come to the class or read a paper you know if you are taking an advanced class you could have students to read a paper before they come to the class. The second item is that we provide incentives for students to pre prepare for the class. So, this is again an important thing because often we may have a doubt saying what, what do I do if students do not watch the video before they come to the class. So, some sort of incentive is required for students to prepare for this class. We will look at what these incentives could be in a minute. The third thing is to facilitate higher level cognitive activities in the classroom. Okay, some examples of this we saw in the previous two examples like you could have a think pair share, you could have a debate, you could have a peer instruction. Okay, peer instruction is nothing but what we have been doing 
as the pole in uh, a view and finally what you want is you want to provide mechanisms for students to get feedback from peers and the instructor on the work that they are doing. So, this feedback goes by the, the term of uh, formative assessment where the student immediately comes to know what they are doing right, what they are not doing right and it also helps the instructor to get a feel of how much the various groups of students are able to deal with the material in their class. Okay. So, those are the key elements of a flipped classroom. Okay. So, now what we will do is we will do another activity, this is the last activity before we summarize. So, what is required now is form groups of 3. So, it appears to me that many of you are uh, being a little relaxed about forming these think pair share and groups. So, I would recommend that you do this activity sincerely. So, form groups of 3 and we will again watch that same video of Pythagoras theorem from Khan Academy. So, we will watch only up to 4 minutes. Then we will assume that students have watched this video before coming to class. Okay. So, what is required will be for you to create activities for the flipped classroom. Okay. So, I will come back to this slide after we watch that video. So, we had paused the video somewhere here at a square plus b square is equal to c square. I will just go on for another 2 3 minutes so that you get an idea of what is the content that students have watched. Terminology here. This long side, the side that is the longest side of our right triangle, the side that is opposite of our right angle, this right here, it is C in this example, this is called a hyp hypotenuse, hypotenuse, very fancy word for a very simple idea. The longest side of a right triangle, the side that is opposite the 90 degree angle is called the hypotenuse. Now that we know the Pythagorean theorem, let us actually solve, let us actually use it because it is, you know, it is one thing to know something, but it is a lot more fun to use it. So, let us say I have the following, let us say I have the following right triangle. Let me draw a little bit neater than that. The following right triangle. It is a right triangle. This side over here has length 9. This side over here has length 7. And my question is, what is this side over here? Maybe we can call that, we will call that C. Well, C in this case, once again, it is the hypotenuse, it is the longest side. So we know that the sum of the squares of the other side is going to be equal to C squared. So by the Pythagorean theorem, 9 squared, 9 squared plus 7 squared is going to be equal to C squared. 9 squared is 81 plus 7 squared is 49. 80 plus 40 is 120, then we are going to have the 1 plus the 9, that is another 10, so this is going to be equal to 130. So this is going, let me write it this way. So this is, the left hand side is going to be equal to 130, and that is equal to C squared. So what is C going to be equal to? Let me rewrite it over here. C squared is equal to 130, or we could say that C is equal to the square root of 130. And notice, I'm only taking the principal root here because c has to be positive. We're dealing with a distance. So we can't take the negative square root. So we'll only take the principal square root right here. And if we want to simplify this a little bit, we know how to simplify our radicals. 130 is 2 times 2 times 65, which is 5 times 13. Well, these are all prime numbers. So that's about as simple as I can get. c is equal to the square root of 130. Let's do another one of these. Okay, so essentially what we saw is that in the video, the first part of the video summarized the formula of the Pythagoras theorem, drew a right angle triangle and said okay a square plus b square is equal to c square and then the second part of the video worked out one example of values of a and b and found out what is the value of c. Okay. So, now assuming that you are teaching this class to whatever level of student that you feel it is appropriate for, maybe you can assume that this is um, seventh standard or some such level. Now, what your job is that think of yourself as a teacher in that classroom and your students have already watched this much part of the video before coming to the classroom. So, now there are two learning objectives that we are giving you. 
So one learning objective is apply Pythagoras theorem to solve a real life problem involving distances. The other learning objective is devise a geometrical proof of Pythagorean theorem. So what you have to do is to create an activity that you will do in the classroom in order to meet these two learning objectives. So you want your students to be able to apply the theorem for solving a real life problem and you want them to be able to devise a geometrical proof. Okay. So the question is what will you do in the classroom so that your students can do this. Yeah, you can do two separate activities, they do not have to be the same activity. You can say that okay, first I will do this so that the first learning objective is met, then I will do a different activity for meeting the learning objective of the second part. Okay. So you could work in now groups of uh, let us say three or four and coordinators can share one or two such activity ideas on AVU chat as and when they come up. Okay. So some of you are already sending me uh, suggestions that uh, I will find the height of a ladder and so on which is kept inclined. So it will be useful if you separate out what you will do in the classroom and what the students will do in the classroom. See because if you are simply going to do one more example of showing a ladder which is kept inclined and work out the example yourself, you can now make out on your own that this is back in the information transmission model. Okay. So please try to distinguish between what you will do in the classroom and what the students will do in the classroom for these activities. So uh, there have been many good suggestions, some uh, centers are still uh, submitting uh, suggestions, I am still reading some of them as they are coming in. Okay. So uh, let me highlight some of the ones which actually do involve the students in doing the activity and can lead to active learning and uh, mastery of the topic. So here is one which says that in a graph sheet draw a triangle and measure the sides. So that is one activity which clearly it is not something that the instructor is going to be doing, the instructor is only posing the problem and the students are doing the work. So they are uh, measuring the sides of the triangle in a graph sheet and thereby they are uh, discovering uh, that the Pythagoras formula is true. Then there is another one which talks about how to track giving a problem on tracking and approaching uh, aircraft, finding the height of a tree, there is another one which talks about finding the distance between three houses. Uh, third one similar one which talks about finding giving the students distance between two places in the city which is from A to B and B to C which are at uh, right angles and then asking them to find the aerial distance between A and C. Other uh, similar applications which are talking about showing the image of a real time application such as the shadow of a building and asking them to do measurements. So the important thing here is that what we want to keep in mind there are still many of them are coming suggestions are coming in. Okay, somebody is saying solving vector based problems. Now if you are going to assume that this is uh, to 6th standard or 7th standard children here it is really going to be hard for you to do solving uh, vector based problems here. There are others which are talking about measure the shortest distance to go from the opposite corners of a rectangular plot that is again a good one because instead of simply saying that find out what is the length of the diagonal of a rectangle this is actually giving it a very practical and a real life uh, context. So another interesting thing that uh, is noticeable from the responses is that all of these, most of these are addressing the first objective of applying Pythagoras theorem to solve a real life problem. Okay. So the second objective of devising a geometrical proof of Pythagoras theorem, we will actually not go into detail right now and we will move on. But that is again something you know, as typical uh, traditional classroom instructor. Let me say that the second learning objective is left as a homework to the students. Okay, so there is one more uh, which is worth uh, highlighting. So which is uh, saying that okay, check the whether the walls of uh, are at right angle or not. So which is actually a use of Pythagoras theorem in order to confirm. So the idea here is a good one because it doesn't ask the student to simply calculate the hypotenuse but it asks the student to use the Pythagoras theorem 
in order to confirm that the angle is indeed 90 degrees. So, that is a good one and uh, yeah there are other uh, equally good ones which are there in the list. So, in the interest of time I will not wait for you to uh, put up the ideas regarding the geometrical proof of the Pythagoras theorem, but I will now move on to talking about how to create a flipped classroom for your class. Okay. So, you can stop sending uh, the chat window uh, responses and it is all very nice to know that yes this flipped classroom can be done and I can look at Khan Academy videos and somebody else has done it for uh, arrays and somebody else has done it for let us say networking and all of those things are fine. But finally, what we are interested is in executing this flipped classroom in our own class. Assuming that we have now uh, got a strong buy in into the idea that I do not want to spend my class time simply telling something to the students, especially nowadays when what I am telling can be easily found in various video sources, various animations, all of those resources being available. So, I do not want to spend my class time in simply telling students something, I want to spend the class time in helping students to assimilate that knowledge, helping students to apply that knowledge and make sure that that content is fixed deeply in their minds. Okay. So, if that is my goal, how do I do this flipped classroom for my class? Okay. So, here are some guidelines, very simple and uh, uh, high level guidelines. First thing to do is from your next topic, choose a concept that will take about 10 minutes of lecturing, concept which imagine that you are a traditional lecturer who is just simply going to go into the classroom and talk about something and choose a topic which will take 10 minutes to explain okay. and then choose a format of pre class activity for this concept. For example, you may find or create a video of the lecture or you may assign some reading material. So, for finding a video there are lots of these videos available. You could look at repositories such as NPTEL, OCW and various YouTube educational channels. So, if you feel that I cannot work with any existing video or if you are feel that okay, my style of explaining is very different, I need to create my own video, then that also is possible and that we will learn in the next lab activity of how you can use your own slides and your own voice and your own visualizations to create your own video. So, having done that, the next thing that you want to do is decide what you will do to ensure that students do the pre class work. Okay. So, you have assigned students to watch the video or read and you need to figure out a mechanism to say uh, what will you do to ensure that this actually happens. Okay. So, the important point here is if the students do not come prepared to the class, then it is possible that the entire class time can be wasted by retransmission. Okay, not just information transmission, but now in this case it will be a retransmission that you will simply repeat whatever was already said in the video simply because the students did not watch the video before they came to class. This is a very common initial problem for the flipped classroom model. So, there are two things that have to be done here. One is that it is important to get the students to understand why we are adopting this model. So, that once they get the idea that they are going to get help for problem solving in the classroom, then they get a lot of buy in. The second thing that has to be convinced to the students is that this is not more work for them. Okay. This is simply the same amount of work, but in a flipped manner. So, instead of them listening to the lecture in the classroom and then solving the problem at home before the exam, now they are listening to the lecture at home and solving the problem in the classroom. So, in terms of number of hours spent in study, there is nothing increasing for the student. And the third thing that is required is that even in spite of this, there may be some incentive that is required, which very easily can be set up in the form of a quiz. So, what you can do is you can give a simple quiz, which has fairly low weightage at the start of the class, maybe the first 5 to 10 minutes of the class which checks some simple concept which was there in the video. So, for example, in the case of the Pythagoras theorem, your, you may simply ask them to state the Pythagoras theorem formula, which will at least ensure that they have seen the first 2 minutes of the video, because it takes 2 minutes before that part of the formula is displayed. And then we create in class activities, 
that will help students to work on the topic. So, how to create these in class activities we saw a few examples and finally, the important thing is to ensure that students get feedback on their work either from peers or from you. So, that is why the activities like think pair share group learning they are more preferred to just activities like individual problem solving. So, in the case of individual problem solving will then be required is that there will have to be a large number of TAs in the classroom who go around and make sure that students are working and determining okay, where a particular student is stuck and assisting students at a fine level. So, some of the effective in class activities that we have already seen are peer instruction this is just to summarize okay, peer instruction questions can be used for ensuring conceptual understanding and for addressing common misconceptions that students may have. Think pair share activities can be used for ensuring that students are able to apply the concepts and they can tackle design problems. So, tackling problems of the type write a sorting algorithm or tackling problems of the type that okay, design a software system for doing something. Okay, so, these type of open problems they can tackle and the third one is group problem solving where you can have students work in groups for extending a given concept or tackling open ended problems. Okay. So, there are also other techniques such as you know which are called team pair solo which also are similar to group problem solving and think pair share which are also fall in this broad category of active learning strategies. So, many of these can be used and what you could do is simply find one which suits the current topic and your current learning goals. Okay, so, now what we will do is we will move to the lab activities. So, create your own video is a lab activity. What we will do immediately is to walk through the lab activity slides and instructions that you want to do in the latter part and then you will also create your own flip class which we will not be able to finish in the lab. So, we will do this as part of the online activity which will happen on Moodle after this particular session is over. So, over next week you will create your own flip classroom and here are some references of sources from where you can learn more about flip classrooms. So, now we will move on to a quick preview of the lab activities.